What is going on, everybody? We just watched The Mandalorian Chapter 21, so this is our breakdown and review of the episode. Nick, anything you want to say right here on the front end of this? This was probably the best episode of the season uh, for me, for sure. Uh, tons of Easter eggs in this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm always going to have my, my Nick picks. Uh, and I have several for this episode, but they're not near as uh, egregious uh, to me as uh, some of the ones in the other episodes. Yeah, I think this episode was easily the best episode of chapter, I'm sorry, of season three. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll get into it. We're going to go ahead and start the the spoiler review right now so if you don't want to hear spoilers you got to bounce so come yep. back and watch this later here we go echo 3 echo 7 all right nick so first thing is first they gave us you know a minute long recap and for the first time this season uh, as as I recollect, we actually see Muff Gideon. The, they they mm -hmm. start the recap uh, with what happened with Muff Gideon. So now we know, as that is in the recap, that that is exactly where we are headed. They're actually yeah. going to tie in and and move this story forward. We get uh, some Bo Katan there. We get Navarro in the recap, and we get. Uh, remember what happened with the pirates. So all this is finally moving forward. A lot of the scenes that we got from the trailer, we know based on what we just saw in the recap, we're going to get those scenes in this episode. Here we go. So the episode actually begins. We are on Navarro and Grief Karga is, I'm sorry, High Magistrate Grief Karga yeah. is planning some things for his city. And he's, he's in there working with some other diplomats and things like that. And then all of a sudden, a pirate ship shows up. It is none other than, what is his name? The salad-looking guy. Yeah, Swamp Thing shows up. Gorian Shard is his name. Yeah. Gorian Shard shows up. So we get the continuation of that story. Uh, like I just said, we knew that that was going to happen. And they have this little standoff. And Grief Karga is like, you know, I got to call out for help. So he is uh, actually going to reach up to or reach out to the New Republic, um, mm -hmm. which you know, in the conversation, I thought it was kind of interesting, Nick, that when Grief Karga said, "Well, you better leave us alone because we're protected by the New Republic." Yeah, when earlier, which I knew that was a lie because earlier in one of the earlier episodes, either ep I think it was the first episode, he says that you know we're independent. You know, right. from the New Republic. So right. I knew he was lying, just trying to basically, you know, bluff him, you know, that there was going to be a bunch of, you know, X-Wings and the New Republic and all that coming to take him out. Yeah, but I thought it was interesting that, that he said, when he mentioned the New Republic, Gorian Shard started laughing. Uh, uh, yeah. Because yeah. he doesn't even see them as a threat. Yeah. Like, the New Republic, ha, 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 I'm not worried about them at all. So that kind of continues to establish the New Republic as a, as a non-threat, you know, yeah, in, they in this suck. era. They, they suck. Yeah. And that, there's several things that happen in this episode that, that just add to that point. Yeah. <laughs> that the New Republic sucks. <laughs> uh, what they're doing with the New Republic is terrible. It's, I, I'm not a fan. Not a fan at all. Yeah, I'm with you. So Gorian Shard opens fire on uh, on Navarro, uh -huh. and it, it shows the people evacuating. And this is this is a Nick pick from me. And if you're new to the channel, we say Nick pick because he's the picky one, and his name is Nick. So they're, yeah. they're Nick picks. So <laughs> yeah. uh, so my Nick pick is the scene. The, it it, st it stuck out to me. I've I've watched the episode twice now. When they're evacuating this entire city, there's literally like 25 people. <laughs> and, yeah. And that's it. <laughs> like you see the city, they show several uh, over uh, head shots, you know, mm. coming down on the city. It's a pretty large city, you know, and it 
and then you see like people running and stuff and and people leaving and yeah even when we see them later it's not like a whole ton of people you would think that this city this town would have with all the different buildings and anything there would be way more people than this yeah and there would be and and and, and maybe you know the mental gymnastics of it is you know only a few escaped the other ones are all hiding underground you know and 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 staying unseen uh until this gets resolved you sure know? M- maybe maybe you could say that it it just stuck it was a part that just stuck out to me and you see it over you see it several times there just yeah. aren't a whole lot of people in the city that are fleeing and that is a a byproduct honestly of using the volume uh, yeah they, 100% they don't have the space to have all those hundreds of extras, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. But anyways, that's just that's my nitpick there. So that's going to take us to uh, the New Republic. Uh, at, you know, the, the message was received, and uh, Captain uh, Taven, ta- is, ta- is Taven, I want to say Tavion from the Jedi Knight games, but it's yeah. Tava. Carson Tava is uh, is yeah. the captain's name. He's the he's the X-wing pilot that we've seen before, and he receives the message from Grief Karga asking for help. And you get this scene that you see right here, guys, of the people at the bar, and you know, a little Easter egg here. You got Filoni in the hat to the right. You got Deborah Chow looking at Filoni, and then uh, our boy Rick over there looking, who's also an executive producer on the series now, uh, looking at Favreau, and then you've got you know Carson. Uh, Tava in the very back there getting the message from Grief Karga so he knows that he, you know, they need help and he's going to go out to the New Republic because he's, the wheels are spinning, the story's moving forward. Carson Tava believes, oh, this is this is a problem. Navarro has an issue. They were taken over by Moff Gideon. TIE fighter pilots were flying over, you know, in their in their atmosphere or whatever. Uh, stormtroopers have have been seen walking the streets, and now they're being overtaken by pirates. Something is going on here. We got to go intervene. So he's going to go and actually speak with the New Republic. And th- I thought that was a pretty cool scene, Nick, when he first shows up uh, to go speak with New Republic headquarters. And you see the images of the X wings and the Y wings and and all that. And he shows up basically to uh, have a conversation about, hey, they need our help. This is the message I got. What can we go do? And he speaks with the guy from Requisitions. Now, there were some parts of this that I thought could have been a little better. You know, they bring yeah. in they bring in the former uh, Imperial Remnant, uh, who is now, you know, definitely working undercover still for Moff Gideon, uh, Aliyah Kane. We, we see her character in this scene. She kind of walks in and just interrupts the colonel and and uh, Carson Tava talking. She walk, hey, I'm going such and such. Do you need anything? Like, she just busts up in the office. Kind of yeah. rude, uh, yeah. honestly. But, you know, and they're having this conversation, and the New Republic's not going to help. That's basically the gist of what we get there. They're not... You know, Navarro is not a planet that is sanctioned by or, or protected by this new republic. So they're like, you know, sorry, we got we got a long list of member planets that we have to help first. Yeah, so um, just to start off from the beginning of where you started, uh, that camera view coming down on that uh, little rebel base, the little rebel fighter base. Mm-hmm. Uh, was awesome. It was probably my favorite shot in the entire episode. We see Y wings coming in. We see some X wings sitting there. Um, then we see see the the bar. And if you look on the bar, it's got uh, a bunch of like stormtrooper and biker scout helmets up there. You know, almost like you know trophies or something. Um, uh, in the little uh, bar area. Uh, so I love that entire scene. Um, one of my nitpicks is you see a lot of old gray haired out of shape people 
is fighter pilots. That's not realistic to me. Uh, they, I think they should all be young guys. The the main X wing uh, uh, Asian guy. Uh, well, I keep, well, I keep forgetting his name. What's Tava. his name? Tava. Yeah, Tava. So uh, you know, he looks more like he would be in a role of of a flight squadron like commander, like on on the base. It, 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 that's sort of like what his role is. But then, you know, after he sees the message and stuff, we get freaking live action Zeb from Rebels. Yes. In here. Yep. Uh which was super cool. Now he's he's got the blue flight suit on and uh that's not a X Wing or a Y Wing suit. Uh like and I don't think it's a B Wing suit either, because I think the B Wings were red uh suits. But I'm not sure what what flight gear he had on for what ship. Maybe the ghost is there. Uh, uh, who knows? Um, I'm sure we'll probably see more of him later on, since this is the sort of the Filoni verse uh, live action that so, we're getting. Yeah. So let me let me break in there on that part. You know, I I, I didn't mention the part of of uh, Zeb being there, uh, but I've got it pulled up here where we could see the scene. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was very cool to see him. Like yeah. I, I knew like immediately when you saw him, it's like, oh, they have a Lasat live on camera, you know, and, and they pulled it off. He looks really good. And then yeah. he starts speaking, and you know, wait a second. That's yeah. that, that that's, that's said. That's said. Yeah. Uh the pro I do have a, a little nitpick with it though. And the, the nitpick is I wouldn't change it. I'm totally fine with it. But in my brain as somebody who grew up with this franchise, this is another character from from Filoni's another created Filoni character that that predates the original trilogy. He was set mm -hmm. before the original trilogy in Star Wars Rebels, and then now we get him in the post Imperial Age in the New Republic era after the original trilogy. So it's another character where we're like, here he is in live action. Where was he during the original trilogy? Yeah, that whole entire time. That you know, you know, and that's again, that's another character that we're gonna have to do that with. Uh, which you know, that's that's the problem when you go to an era before the original trilogy and you create all these people, you know, and you then you bring him in afterwards. Um, yeah, which we're yeah, gonna I get the whole fair. we're gonna get the whole crew of rebels. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not against it. It's just something that kind of sticks. It's an it's an unfortunate part of storytelling when you when you retroactively tell stories and you go backwards and then you go forwards and then you go back again and you go forward yeah that's just and you start introducing new characters yeah. and new storylines and then they sometimes the puzzle pieces don't quite fit right and you got to take a hammer and smash it and force it yeah so one thing is like uh Alia Kane's character. Now, going back to this New Republic, you know, yeah. it, it, they tied her in well. It's obviously she's working, you know, against the New Republic. Um, but why isn't she in a cubicle? <laughs> why does? She, yeah. Why, why is she walking here like, at this moment? I don't know. It's just kind of it, it's the main like facility. Like the like headquarters. Yeah. Uh, um, I I don't get it. Uh, but you know whatever. So uh, basically, uh, Captain Tava is told no. The story continues. Grief Karga is telling the people, "Hey, don't worry. I got this under control. I have reached out for help. The New Republic is coming. They're not." So nope. Captain Tava, uh, on his own accord goes to the secret hideout and here comes a Nick pick guys. Oh yeah. And, I, and I'm going to let, and I'm going to let you do one. it. He, <laughs> I love the scene in the X wing of him flying the sounds and everything. They pulled that off really well. And he shows up at the coven for the Mandalorians led by the armor. Um, and it's supposed to be a secret hideout that nobody's supposed yeah. to know about. Yeah. But there's a rebel there. Go ahead. Yeah, R five D four the the rebel droid that was all through the original trilogy helping out the alliance. <laughs> uh, this is another 
thing that just doesn't add up. We only see R five D four in the first Star Wars movie. Uh, he blows his motivator. Uh, of course, everybody knows the story, and then they end up getting R two, and he's probably you know back with the Jawas, and they'll repair him or whatever. But we never see or hear from that character again. This is another shoehorned in OG character to just jiggle the the dangling keys in front of you you know like come on guys it's r5d4 like he's a he's a part of this now you know like like like, like, just give us something something else like you know if r2 would have been there that would have been but of course r2's with luke but you know they could have come up with something else you know oh i tracked you here because there's a tracker on r5 and they didn't it even just, say there was a tracker on R5. Like, that that makes no sense. Yeah, like, but he was tracking it because you saw him looking at his screen, and he's like, you know, dee, 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 you like, know, and it's like, oh, there he is. So it, so it doesn't make sense because R5-D4 has been on Tatooine for 20-something years. And how does this guy know that R5's with Mando? Yeah, like it just that part doesn't make sense. So I would say that part gets two big thumbs down. You should have yeah. come up with a, a better way to be able to track uh the coven. Uh and I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not the writer, so I I can't really suggest a better way to do it. But this didn't work. This was a glaring like, ooh, that just doesn't fit. That's this, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, is an example of poor writing. This part yeah. of the story, uh, yep. You know, this was the worst part of the story, by the way. Uh, yeah this this was forcing the puzzle piece that doesn't fit yeah. to fit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we continue uh, on uh, now. One thing that I uh, that I thought was kind of kind of weird was when Captain Tavis shows up. He's not welcomed. He, he's being told to leave, and then Mando walks out and starts talking like. Like Mando is the leader. <laughs> yeah, like, he's the leader <laughs> like, of, of of this whole bunch. You know, you just got redeemed. You were totally rejected. You know, a yeah. week ago. You now know? you're just another one of the 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 guys there. Yeah, but it's I, like he's the leader. I thought that was kind of weird. Uh, and another thing is like that I, that I thought was weird in the in the conversation between between Captain Tava and Mando, I, I guess I need to go back and freshen up on previous seasons. But Captain Tava kept drilling in the point that, look, Grief Karga is your friend. I'm just, you know, I'm I'm letting you know. He's in trouble. We can't help. It's got to be you. Grief Karga is your friend. Grief Karga is your friend. Grief Karga is your friend. And I'm like, how does, how he, does he know that? I, I don't get that. I, yeah. How does he know that? Like, uh, I, I, Met- he, he dealt with Mando for such a short period of time. Yeah, like I'm talking chased, about ch- chased him and then left him for dead. Yeah, on uh, ice, ice world. So this is another forced piece of the. This whole scene right here, just from R five to him showing up anyways to him saying he's your friend, he's your friend. All that's forced, and it's it's just. This is this is a this is a they get a they get an F on this part, you know. Just yeah. got to say it for what it is. So yeah, uh, Din Djarin, in a, in a cool scene after that, you know, he leaves. Din Djarin in this cool scene petitions the Mandalorians for their help with the with the speaking stick, which it's not really a speaking stick because the whole time yeah. somebody's holding the stick, you hear everybody else talking the whole time. So it's not yeah. really a speaking stick. Yeah. I I thought that was dumb that they had to hold the stupid little hammer to like speak, but you know, whatever. Again, another little dumb part for me, um, that's not yeah. really that big of a deal. I did like the part of, you know, he asked for their help to go Rescue Navarro. The armorer asks, would anybody else like to speak? And then Paz Vizsla does. And Paz uh-huh. Vizsla's like, why? Why should we help these people? Look what they did to us. And then he's like, because we're Mandalorians. Man, I got to... When that happened, dude, I, I didn't really see that coming. 
I didn't either. I because I thought he was being like, we don't owe them and nothing. Why are we going to sacrifice more? Who's going to sacrifice for us? You yeah. know, who, whoever sacrifices for Mandalorians, no one. So, so but it, it went the opposite way. So in the middle of the scene, what I was trying to say was, I got a I got a Return of the King, uh, King Theoden talking to the people right before they charged the enemy. Like that's the kind of feeling it gave me. I was yeah. like, "Wow, let's go!" He just and Rohan will answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it was a it was a really good scene. Um, I liked yeah. it a lot. So so they're all on the same page. Like this is the way. Let's go. Yeah. So and then and- after that, it was it was nonstop action for the remainder of the episode. After that, and I got to say, there was not a dull moment uh, from them showing up. And fighting against, you know, they, they got their plan. Um, Bo-Katan and Mando comes up with the plan. They go execute the plan. You see, Navarro has already been trashed by the pirates. It was like all pristine and clean and great looking. Yeah. Man, these pirates, they destroyed this place in no time. Like, yeah. it's looking like it did before already. Yeah, it's all jacked up. Mm-hmm. So then you got the space battle and you got the the main pirate ship that's under attack by Mando. And then, now I did think it was kind of funny. Uh, again, this is, this is a Nick pick for me, but when, when the N one first shows up and, and hits the pirate ship, the, the, uh, the Gorian shard says it's, it's the Mandalorian. What? Like, why would he call Din Djarin the Mandalorian? Like, yeah, there's a ton of Mandalorians coming at you. <laughs> Like, I just, I don't know. That's, that just kind of stuck out to me. Like, guys, everybody in the and, galaxy doesn't call Din Djarin the Mandalorian. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, but I know that they call him Mando on the show, but I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and that whole, a, a lot of that whole fighting scene, which I loved the, the battling and, and all that stuff. I thought it was all cool and stuff. But very unrealistic. Like uh, the N1 and then Bo Katan ship against that big, huge uh, ship and, and all of its fighters, and neither one of them w- wind up with a scratch. I mean, if, if those are the kind of pirates those are, I don't know how they could take over anything. Yeah. Like, they got like taken down really easily. They got taken down so easily. Yeah. Like, you know, it would have been so much cooler, which it would have been more expensive if if the Mandalorians were like, we actually came here in ships, you know, and they had their own ships. And then, you know, there was an all out fight and in their sh- Mandalorian ships were getting blown up. Mandalorians were dying. Pirates were dying. Uh, uh, Din Djarin and uh, Bo-Katan ship were heavily damaged in the fight and needed repairs and that sort of stuff. And, you know, they, they had just pulled, pulled it out. Um, you know, the win, uh, that would have been more realistic. This was like a video game with the God mode code put in. (laughs) Um, yeah. And they just wiped out everybody. Uh, no threat. The pirates really posed no threat at all. And that's the, again, goes back to, Probably on on a to some extent a budget um, uh, issue with the with the episode and the show, uh, but for also just a story issue and writing uh, problem for me. It just it just wasn't it it wasn't good. Even though I liked the eye candy of the whole thing, it just it really wasn't that good. There there wasn't a threat in the air. Yeah, like, like they they had Din Djarin and Bo Katan had air superiority. Against all those ships and a main big ship, yeah, and that doesn't really make sense. the Mm-mm. The Mandalorians had more of a danger on the ground, and they yeah. outnumbered the pirates on the ground. It looked like to me, yeah. Um, uh, you know, on the whole, I don't know, but but again, the whole thing worked for me. It was fun to watch. I, I enjoyed yeah. the whole the whole. Ba- we got a battle, a simultaneous battle in the air and on the ground. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed that. It really yeah, it, yeah. it reminded me of Hoth. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, what everything that was going on. I thought it was good. Yeah, it was uh 
it was again it was cool it was cool eye candy uh it was it was fun to watch um it just it wasn't believable or realistic i love the ship getting destroyed when yeah, they, when yeah. they destroyed the last engine and then it's crashing as they were trying to kill all the people, I thought that was a really cool scene, and it reminded me of the the Super Star Destroyer crashing into the Death Star. The same sound effects and stuff was yeah, used yeah. in that scene yeah. um, that they used in Jedi. Uh, I noticed that when I was watching it, uh, which was a nice callback. The, ep- um, the episode ends with Grief Karga. Well, it doesn't end, actually. It's close to ending. Grief Karga is welcoming the Mandalorians. They have a home on Navarro, all of them. And the Mandalorians accept. They're going to live there. You are now part of the tribe. So they're going to live yeah. there. Uh, and, but then we get to a pretty cool scene. The armorer wants to speak with Bo-Katan. And she tells Bo-Katan to remove her helmet. And now we're moving the story forward. Now yeah. it's making it's not it's not that it's making more sense, but it's actually like happening now. You know, and the the armorer says, you know, you've seen the mythosaur. You know, it was just a story yeah. of legend and you know, remove your helmet and you are going to be the person that's going to reunite our people be- mm-hmm. because you walk both worlds. We respect you with you, you are one of us, and now you can remove your helmet. You yeah. are going to be all of our leader, and that was a cool scene. I, I like it. To, I like. I enjoy stories where the person with power over people gives some of that power up. I enjoy yeah. watching that. That was a cool moment between the armor and Bo-Katan. So basically, uh, they walk back out there. Bo Katan doesn't have her helmet on. And mm-hmm. the Mandalorians are like, looking at her like, what? What the heck? <laughs> you know, uh, heretic, you know? Yeah, she is a Mandalorian <laughs> no more. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and then the armor says, nope, this is what we're doing now. And uh, yeah. so we're changing our cult perspective. <laughs> yep, we're, we're, changing, we're changing it all. Uh, so, and I, and I got to tell you, with that scene, um, that scene right there for the first time this season made me more interested in the Mandalorian story arc, the reuniting of that world, the redemption of all Mandalorians coming back together, being united, being a force like that scene with Bo-Katan at the end. It did it for me. Like now, yeah. I don't think that the story, the story arc, is like an A plus by any means. I wouldn't have chosen it. Uh, I, I'm not. I, I. It's not as good of an arc as season one and two. A lot of Star Wars fans aren't caring so much about the Mandalorians. I, I get that the show is titled The Mandalorian, but yeah. you know that's not what this show has been about. The whole time until season three, yeah. You know? I mean, I mean, from from the if you just watch the first, I mean, just from the first episode, they sh- set the show up as here's a a, a Mandalorian, a, a solo Mandalorian who is a bounty hunter. Um, it's it's very much a, a Boba Fett show without Boba Fett. Yeah, but yeah. now it's it's the story arc this season. We get it. It's about pushing the Mandalorian you know, as a whole forward, bringing those people back together. And for the first time this season, I am more on board with that is I guess what I'm trying to say. And it's because of this episode that, that it, it's made me more interested. And, and I got to tell you, I'm excited to see what Bo-Katan does. You know, um, that's, she has, Katie Sackhoff has killed it this season. I love yeah. her character. I'm all, I'm, I'm down with the whole thing. You know, I'm I'm all down. Again, same same problem here that I had with with Zeb, Bo Katan, Clone Wars era character, pre original trilogy. Now she's back again. Why wasn't she helping during the Imperial yeah. era? Yeah, but, and and, and she still looks like the same age. Yeah, <laughs> she does. <laughs> so now, final scene. There's a Lambda shuttle class uh, in the middle of space. Mm-hmm. And uh, our buddy Tava is out patrolling. Uh, he's probably heading back to, to the new Republic headquarters. And he sees this, so he investigates it. 
R2. And I found that to be weird. You you know, if if he's leaving where where the Mandalorians are, um, you know, when when you're leaving the planet, it's like, all right, I gotta go to this planet, back to this base. So you just hyper jump. He was just like floating in, like in the middle of space. I mean, space is huge, yeah. and he just happens to come across this uh, shuttle. Like, he didn't say anything like, hey, we we lost. It, the whole thing could be fixed with, like, a couple sentences of, hey, we lost track of, of a ship. This was its last known coordinates. You know, as he's leaving, and he's like, well, I'm heading, getting ready to head back. I'll stop and, and, and go to these coordinates and check it out. Yeah. Boom, problem solved. But instead, he's just, it just shows him floating in space and he just happens to come across it. Again, just a bad storytelling, bad storytelling and um, just not believable. And, and it could have easily been fixed, but continue. Yeah. Look, and I'm not, I'm not really pushing back, but all of that could have happened and they just didn't show it to us. You know what I mean? But but yeah. I, I I know I, I I get it. It just kind of came out of nowhere. Um, but anyways, he investigates. The crew is dead, and it turns out that this was this was the prison transport. This is the ship that Moff Gideon was on, and then they reveal at the very end uh, there's something in the wall, and it's Beskar armor. It's a it's a best it's a piece of Beskar armor, and he says Moff Gideon was rescued by the by the Mandalorians or somebody says that I think it was over the radio or whatever. And then that's where they leave us. Now I, I don't know where we're headed. Um, and, and I'm not saying that as a negative at all. Um, I don't, you know, I'm going to assume that Moff Gideon is going to have a new suit and he might have a Mandalorian suit. Uh, what role does a Mandalorian, a piece of Beskar have in the, in the wall? of that craft. I, yeah. I have no idea what that, what that means. Uh, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're even going to explain that to us in the next episode. Who knows? But Moff yeah. Gideon is coming. He has been rescued. He never stood trial. It's funny that like nobody knows that. That's not like public knowledge. Why wouldn't they put out an APB on Moff Gideon? Yeah. Like, Hey, his, his, uh, his transport net never made it yeah. to its location. You know, uh, again, these problems could be solved with with just adding a couple lines of dialogue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, His escape know. is a mystery to the galaxy. Yeah. Like, how does a high ranking pilot in the New Republic not know that the the man that they captured is has not escaped? Like yeah. like you would think the moment he escaped, everybody should have known. Yep. You know, but okay. Uh, maybe everybody will know now. I don't know. Are they making it look, Nick, like that just happened? I didn't really get that sense that he just, that like, this is fresh. This just happened. It made it look like this happened. Like it's been there. Like it's been there a while. Yeah. That's the sense that I got from it. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all those things that we said, I really enjoyed the episode, though. And yeah. uh, you know, did you make it this far in the video where I'm I'm telling you I really enjoyed the episode? I'm gonna give it uh, an eight. I could give it an eight point five. I'm gonna give it an eight point two five. That's what I'm gonna give it out of ten. Eight point two five. Lots of action. Lots of awesome scenes. It was moving fast. It it had me hooked the entire time. Uh, if it weren't for like the R five D four and Captain Tavis showing up at the at the coven, uh, you know, out of nowhere. Some of these things just happening out of nowhere. Um, it, that's the reason that it's not an eight point five or even a nine. But I yeah. enjoyed the episode by far for me the best episode of this season. Maybe we're going to have a strong finish here at the end. Yeah, hopefully. Um... Also, I wanted to add one more thing before I give my final score. I I really liked the aliens callback from the little probe droid where it had the little lasers, mm -hmm. like like when the little droid 
uh, cut into the ship where Ripley was at the beginning of Aliens and was scanning the space. Yeah. They used the same effects uh, with that uh, little probe from the R2 unit, which was a nice callback. Uh, I liked it. Um, so I, I'm at uh, I, I, I'm at an eight on this. Wow. Um, okay. Because right. it... And 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 that's that's a that's a really high score for this episode, with as many little uh, Nick picks that I had with it, and some of the stuff that just doesn't make sense. Mm. Uh, it the writing, some of the dialogue in here, right. uh, the hail, don't hail me again. You know the Star Trek references. Uh, I, I had some small issues with it here and there, but but overall, I thought it was a uh, it was a it was a decent episode. Definitely best episode of the season uh, for me as well. Uh, and yeah, I give it a I'll give it a I'll give it an eight. All right. Very good. Well, guys, let us know in the comments what you think. That's what's most important for us. Please give this video a like. Come and see us this coming Saturday night as we break this thing down with you guys and our community and cover all things Star Wars on our weekly Saturday night Star Wars and entertainment show that we call EBN Live. We always say here, we are you are Echo Base Network. May the force be with you, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Bye, guys.